Now, the problem with the date is that Gerald and I have been married for 43 years, which ought to get some kind of an award, right? <laughs> and that without benefit of a temple marriage. Yeah. Now, on, <laughs> on my... <laughs> yes. Uh, on the 42 years aspect, the question is, am I counting from the time of my first doubts? My first vocal questions, my first challenge to the bishop, uh, when I set the date of my marriage, when I went to my excommunication trial, or when I gave up the Book of Mormon. I guess it boils down to your definition of what is, is. <laughs> so, <laughs> now I'll leave this to the guys at Farms to try to decide if I've overstated or understated the number of years. <laughs> or maybe I just can't count, uh, but I refuse to explain on the grounds that it might tend to incriminate me. <laughs> just to set the record straight, a newspaper in Colorado once ran an article on Mormonism, and in it they mentioned Gerald and I and our writing on Mormonism. In the article they mentioned that I was the great-great-grandmother of Brigham Young. <laughs> I am the great great granddaughter of Brigham Young. I was raised on faith promoting stories about Brigham Young. I knew I descended from a legal wife, Mary Ann Angel. However, I hadn't been informed that he had at least 50 or more other wives. I knew he had some others, but I thought, like, you know, five or six. I, I had no idea the scope of this, and I didn't realize he had had 56 children, give or take one or two. But I grew up knowing he was a prophet. How else could he have designed the tabernacle and laid out the streets of Salt Lake if it wasn't by prophetic ability? I never heard anything negative about him in my youth. My great-great-grandpa, uh, great -great no, I put too many greats in there. My great-grandpa was Brigham Young Jr., son of Brigham Young. He was an apostle and president of the Quorum of the Twelve at the turn of the century. And I descend from his, one of his plural wives, Abby Stevens. Abby Stephen Young was still alive when I was a young girl in grade school. Uh, in fact, visiting with great grandma Young, it never occurred to me that polygamy would ever have been for lust. Uh, <laughs> because she was a pretty uh, plain looking uh, ancient woman. <laughs> Uh, but one of Great Grandma Young's stories, uh, faith-promoting stories, was how God pre protects those that are faithful to live the law of God. And so she used to tell how that when the wicked uh, federal officers would come looking for Great Grandpa Young, uh, that uh, they had to devise ways to keep him from the law. And of course, the law was always the bad guys. It wasn't that there could be a legitimate legal issue here. We realize, you know, they, that it was always bad. They were the bad side, trying to get the righteous people. And uh, so she told of how one day, when they got an advance warning that the marshal or somebody was coming, um, and that this would have been here in Utah, that uh, she devised this plan. She told uh, Brigham Jr. to quick get in her bedclothes and her night hat and all and to lay in the bed and just kind of shiver and moan and act like she's real, he was real sick. So when the uh, uh, federal guys came in, she, they wanted to know if they could search the house. And she said, well, yes, but my poor mother is dying and she's very, very ill. So you can search the whole house, but please don't disturb her. And so they said, okay, fine. They come, they look under the bed, all through the house, everything, and they don't find Brigham Jr. So they leave. Uh, and so that was Grandma's story to me of how God protects the faithful. Now, she didn't happen to mention that, you know, Grandpa was participating uh, not only in polygamy, but post-manifesto polygamy. But that's life in uh, the young household. Um, their son, Walter, married a woman by the name of Sylvia Pierce. And uh, the Pierce family also has a place in Mormon history. I didn't appreciate the Pierce family heritage at the, my younger years, 
because I had never told where they really fit in the scheme of things. And if you read Will Bagley's new book on Mountain Meadow Massacre, you'll find out about the other part of my family, the Pierces. Uh, my great-great-grandfather was Harrison Pierce, and my, uh, I'm gonna get my greats wrong here, and my great-grandpa would have been uh, James Pierce. James Pierce and Harrison Pierce both participated at Mountain Meadow Massacre, and in Will's book, you'll read about how uh, during the massacre, when James, uh, he had only been 18 at the time, tried to protect a girl uh, from being killed, Harrison came up, tried to get the girl from her, and shot James and pierced his ear. Uh, Harrison has uh, an <laughs> uh, infamous quality of being known for uh, his fanaticism in southern Utah, and was one of the ones really pushing for the extermination of the whole wagon train. So I have an illustrious past on both sides of my <laughs> mother's family, um, of uh, both ends of the Mountain Meadow Massacre. I remember uh, in the 60s, uh, when we were living here in Utah, a cousin of my grandma's, a woman named Mildred, came to stay a while at my grandma's house. Everyone came to stay at grandma's house because she's up on the avenues and had this great big two-story house and everyone stayed there for free lodging so they could go do temple work. So Mildred kind of moved in and lived there for a year or two uh, so she could do temple work. Well, one day she noticed on grandma's bookshelf that she had a copy of uh, John D. Lee's book, Mormonism Unveiled, and she asked Grandma if she could take it to her room to read it, and Grandma said, yeah. And then sometime later, Grandma realized the book had never shown back up on the shelf, and so she asked Mildred to give it back, and Mildred said, oh, Sylvia, I destroyed that book. <laughs> and she said, why would you destroy that? Well, it lists the pierces in the back of that, and that's participants in the Mountain Men, no massacre, you wouldn't want the family to ever see that. And uh, so that was life with Mildred. <laughs> and I knew Mildred. I mean, she was a nice old lady, but she was very protective of our family's deep, dark secret. Uh, my grandma, uh, who Sylvia, who married Walter Young, must have had some reservations in her life, in her younger life, because my mother says when she was growing up that my grandma would tell her children. My grandma had nine kids. I mean, just so obviously they were. Uh, kind of locked into the system. But she would tell her kids, don't stand up in testimony meeting and say, I know it's true. Say you believe it's true. You aren't old enough yet to use the word, I know. Which, for a, I mean, a Mormon in that time frame, uh, she obviously had some questions she wasn't talking about. Uh, by the way, my grandma boasted that my grandpa never saw her naked in her whole life, and she had nine children. They <laughs> gave birth to all of them at home. Um, when, uh, when grandma and grandpa, after grandma and grandpa got married, the Pierces and the Youngs uniting, uh, now remember, Walter's raised in a polygamist home. He, his mother is a polygamist wife of Brigham Young Jr. And so he still converted to the polygamy idea. This is after the turn of the century. So he wants grandma to go into polygamy. And my mother grew up knowing who the woman was that grandpa wanted to marry. Um, but when he proposed this to Sylvia, uh, Sylvia being a very um, creative person uh, and somewhat of an independent mind, uh, tells the story that as they were sitting on the couch, she went into this trance state and had a vision, and her spirit went up into the corner of the room, and the next thing she knew, Walter was shaking her. Sylvia, Sylvia, wake up, what's the matter, what's the matter? And Grandma comes through and says, Walter, God has revealed to me that we are not to go into polygamy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we thought in the family that that had put an end to the whole thing, however, after uh, the oldest aunt, after my grandma died, my oldest aunt died, and we got to going through all the old family papers that my aunt had kept in her possession, we found a postcard uh, dated around the 1912 period, I think. And uh, this postcard starts out, to my loving husband Walter kind of thing. Uh, hope you can come see the boys soon. Uh, we miss you, blah, blah, blah. Your affectionate wife, so-and-so, only so-and-so, wasn't Sylvia. <laughs> and so when my mom and sister are going through all these old papers, my sister sees this card and she says, Mom, this isn't Grandma's handwriting. 
who's this? And no one in the family has a clue who this woman is, where she fits, there's no <coughs> records, we have no idea. All we have is a postcard <laughs> to my loving husband, Walter. So, <laughs> evidently Grandma's revelation didn't work. <laughs> uh, another sign of Grandma's independence, this is all part of my apostasy. My apostasy started with this Grandma. In the 1940s, when Fawn Brody brought out her No Man Knows My History, uh, it, it was a horrible thing, you know, I mean, oh, heaven forbid anyone should ever even be seen browsing in the bookstore into this thing. Well, uh, at some point, there was an announcement made here in Salt Lake, and I don't know how far afield, about no one, I mean, to the Sisters and Relief Society, no one is to read that book. Sisters? <laughs> Don't go read that book. Okay, so my grandma, being the curious kind, wanted to know <laughs> what it was she wasn't supposed to read. <laughs> so she went down to the bookstore and bought one. <laughs> and uh, this started her on a journey. It started my mother and my oldest aunt on a journey of trying to figure out the roots of Mormonism. Now, my family had some of the old books, but my grandma, aunt, and mother started scouring used bookstores to acquire more old books, uh, original books and uh, earlier things on Mormonism, and uh, thus started their pilgrim. Uh, my grandma always wore her garments. In fact, uh, I mean, even after she left the church, she left her wore her garments. Um, she always had an extra pair in her purse. <laughs> because my grandma loved to travel. And so she was always ready. If anyone in the family, I mean, she had extended family all over creation. I swear we must have re be related to half of the people in the West. And uh, she was ready at the drop of a hat to go with anyone anywhere. You know, just point your car. If you got room, grandma wants to go. And so she figured if she had a toothbrush and an extra pair of garments, she was ready for anything. <laughs> Well, one day when they were uh, out of town visiting, uh, I mean, a few hours drive from home visiting someone, and some family came from Arizona, uh, the Pierces helped found uh, Taylor, Arizona, and so Grandma had a lot of relatives down there. So she decided it was somebody that was visiting from there, she was going to hop in the car and go back to Taylor and visit all her old family. But she thought, well, maybe she'd need a little more than just one pair of garments. Well, she and her oldest daughter were of the same size. So she took my aunt in the other room and made her strip uh, all her clothes. And uh, she, it was winter, so she had a coat. And she said, well, you'll be OK. You're just driving back home. Uh, you just wear your coat home. And Grandma took all her clothing with her. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> moving up into the uh, late 50s, um, when the Tabernacle Choir was going to go on a tour of Europe, Grandma decided she wanted to go too, but she hadn't renewed a recommend for a while. And she wanted to go through uh, the Swiss Temple. Uh, so she went to the bishop for an interview. And, uh, I mean, you know, a little ward up on the avenues here, everybody knows everybody, known everybody for a hundred years, you know, so uh, the bishop says, well, how's it all going? Oh, everything's fine, cool, you know. And she, well, she wouldn't have used cool, but everything's fine. <laughs> and um, he says, well, you know, I just have to go through a couple of the rudimentary questions here. Um, so uh, are you keeping the word of wisdom? And she says, oh, yeah, I keep the word of wisdom. Well, I do have a cup of coffee in the morning, but other than that, yeah, I keep the word of wisdom. <laughs> and uh, the bishop says, well, Sylvia, I can't give you a temple recommend then. And she says, why not? And he said, well, you, you just said you have coffee in the morning. And she said, yeah. Bishop, you and I know, everyone on my block has coffee in the morning. And he said, yes, but they didn't tell me. <laughs> uh, one, one time, at this point, my grandma was still kind of hanging on to Mormonism, and I told her that I had heard a, uh, a rumor. This, this is, I'm jumping up in the story up into the 60s. Uh, or 70, I can't remember the time frame, but I had heard that the church was going to soon change to where you could wear the short garments in the temple. And uh, up until then, you had to wear the long ones when you went through the ceremony, but they were in a change of where you, just, you could wear the short ones in the temple. And so I told my grandma about this, and she said, if they do that, I'll know there's no truth to the Mormonism. Uh. Well, that soon happened. 
and uh, she did eventually leave. But like I said, she always wore garments. Uh, and when she died, uh, she was uh, she, her funeral was here in Salt Lake. In fact, it was just down the street uh, in one of the local mortuaries. And uh, she was all decked out in her temple clothing, but she had a Protestant funeral service. <laughs> I'm sure this gave the neighbors a little bit of uh, curiosity. And uh, it wasn't long after that a new rule was passed down that if you were buried in your temple clothes, it had to be conducted by a bishop. And I don't know if Grandma had a factor in getting that rule passed, but uh, sequentially, hers came first. Um, after I left Mormonism, my mother told me of her experience when she and my dad got married in the Salt Lake Temple. And, um, I mean, I'd grown up hearing about the temple ceremony, but it was always put to me in these very abbreviated forms of, oh, well, they, uh, they act out a play about the creation, and you learn about the overview of the church and the gospel, and, uh, you know, that was kind of the gist of it. So... I says, well, uh, one day I asked her, I said, well, how'd you really feel when you went through the temple? Now, so this is after I leave the church, so now she can tell me what she really thinks. And she says, well, it was horrible. Uh, that she says, but it was also funny, because she said, when we went in and sat down, you know, the women are on one side and the men on the other, she says, your dad was the only guy in the audience that had his hat on crooked and turned the wrong way as everybody else, and I sat there wondering if I should laugh or cry. <laughs> uh, then she said it absolutely ruined their wedding night because my dad was so fanatic he wouldn't let her take her wedding her undergarments off for their wedding night and mom said she felt so ugly uh, that it just ruined the whole evening for her uh, and you know back in the 30s the garments uh, were a lot more cumbersome and heavy in the material and everything than they are now. And so uh, she did not find this a, a beautiful experience. Well, I was uh, born here in Salt Lake City, but I was raised in Southern California. In grade school, uh, at my grade school, everyone was Protestant but three girls. There was Ellen, she was a Jewish girl, and then there was Alice, who was Catholic, and then there was me that was Mormon. Well, Ellen and I soon formed a great friendship and hung around together. But we didn't allow Alice to hang around with us, because after all, Alice was pretty. <laughs> In eighth grade, uh, some little girl uh, found out I was Mormon, and I don't know what her parents had told her, but anyways, she came up to me and she said, Sandra, uh, I understand you're Mormon. And I said, yes. And she said, well, tell me what the Mormons believe about God. So oh, I'm trying to think, oh, okay, what do you say? Oh, I, I got it, I got it. <laughs> As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. And I was so proud of myself for remembering that thing. And she just looked at me horrified and dropped her jaw. And she said, Sandra, that's blasphemy. And walked away. <laughs> now, I might tell you that uh, my real claim to flame, fame in life is that I went to high school with Richie Valens uh, in San Fernando High which was hardly a place to promote a good Mormon upbringing. Uh, but in spite of my wild high school, uh, I was able to retain a social life completely within the Mormon community. I got up early to go to seminary, uh, and I mean early, ours was at six in the morning, and then I went to school. But when I came home from school, I would find my mom with the Journal of Discourses spread out on the floor. Or she would have church, old church books spread out on the floor. Or old documents spread out on the floor that she's going through and marking up. And I think, oh my word, it's another one of those days. <laughs> and when we'd get ready to go to Sunday school, back then, Mormons never took their scriptures to church. You all had a manual, and you just took the manual. If you took your scriptures, you were suspect because you were doubting Thomas if you had to look something up. <laughs> and uh, we'd get up to go to church on Sunday, and if my mom picked up her scriptures, oh, I knew it was going to be one of those kind of Sundays. You know, it's going to be fair. In fact, one time uh, she and my aunt uh, 
went to Sunday school and were asking questions and some guy got so excited about the whole thing he jumped up and shook his fist at my mom and aunt and told them only an adulterous nation seeks after a sign. Um, and that was supposed to silence them. After that, uh, my mom tried the, uh, that was in gospel doctrine class. So uh, then she tried going to the investigators class because she thought, well, you know, okay, I'm an investigator. Uh, maybe someone's got some answers. And uh, that got her in trouble. And so uh, the bishop soon told her she couldn't attend that class, that all she had left was genealogy, and she didn't want to do that. So uh, kind of cramped her church attendance. Um, when I was going to seminary, the year that we studied Old Testament became problematic because we had Jehovah's Witness neighbors. And they had talked to us about the importance of calling God Jehovah. So in seminary, we were taught that when uh, Moses talked to the Lord face to face, that was Elohim, and that's how you knew that God the Father had a physical body. Now Jesus is Jehovah, and he's usually the God that shows up in the Old Testament. But once in a while, it's Elohim. And that's how we know that he's got a body, because of those places. So um, <laughs> my mom asked me one day, well, how do we know when it's Elohim or Jehovah? Why don't you ask in seminary <laughs> how we know which it is? And so I go off to seminary and I raise my hand and, you know, how do we know when it's Elohim or when it's Jehovah? Uh, oh, well, because this verse shows that God has a physical body, so we know that's Elohim. Now, most of the time over here it's Jehovah. And I said, well, yeah, but in their way it's hell. Well, yeah, you tell by the context. We use these to prove God has a body. Otherwise, it's Jehovah. <laughs> and I thought, eh, and I don't think that's going to sell at home. So I didn't go home and tell that to my mom. She was always coming up with questions for me to ask at the seminary or something. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, so you can see where that was all heading. Um, in my ward as a teenager, our uh, bishopric was, this is in Southern California, we had a really fanatic bishopric, and in fact, uh, one of the counselors decided one fast Sunday that he was going to help us all out, because uh, we looked like we were kind of slacking off, and so he turned off all the drinking fountains in the building, uh, <laughs> because he felt that we shouldn't even have water on fast Sunday. Uh, they, they used to send around, uh, you know, the kids to get your fast offering, and when they'd come to our house, they'd have this little spiel that'd say that we're collecting for the worthy poor. And uh, my mom finally got so fed up with all this, and one Sunday she told the kid, when you start collecting for the unworthy poor, come around and I'll give you some money. <laughs> In, um, I graduated from seminary uh, when I was in, at the end of the 11th grade, and so in 12th grade I started going to Institute of Religion, which was a new program that just started in Southern California. Uh, 12th grade uh, in the Institute wasn't a problem. I sailed along pretty good. I think my mother must have been too busy at that time to bring up questions or something, because I don't remember any great troubling things at that point. But when I started into uh, junior college, I was enrolled in a different institute class, and different things started coming up uh, that would remind me of things my mother brought up before. And so, I mean, I'd, I'd just pop up my hand and I'd say, oh, well that reminds me, I've always wondered about X, you know. And this went on for a few weeks, you know, oh, by the way, uh, how does that relate to X, you know. And so I'm asking these different questions. Finally, the institute teacher asked me to stay after class. And uh, he says, Sandra, you're disturbing a girl who's investigating the church that comes to institute with your questions. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, geez, the solution would be answer the question. <laughs> but he didn't see it that way, you know. So I could ask the page, but you know, that was about the extent. Well, it was about this time I came to Salt Lake City under the pretext to see my grandparents, who all lived here. Uh, actually, I had a boyfriend at the BYU, and I was afraid he was looking at other girls. Turned out he was. Um, <laughs> but my grandma, and this was Grandma Sylvia Young, uh, asked me to take her to a meeting. And she didn't tell me what kind of meeting it was. I thought it was going to be a bunch of old fogies. Uh, anyways, I walked up to this house on the west side of Salt Lake in this nice, tall, a uh, good-looking young man answers the door, and his name's Gerald Tanner. 
And this is not a Mormon meeting. Gerald at this point, who also comes from a fifth generation Mormon family, had uh, run across some reorganized people who had got him thinking and questioning Utah Mormonism. It started him on a quest where he went back to Independence, Missouri to visit all the true churches. And the uh, uh, net result of that was he had uh, reduced it all down to, well, he could still believe the Book of Mormon, but it looked like the rest was going to be scrap. <laughs> so Gerald was having these meetings to uh, play some tapes of friends of his from Missouri that had made this journey out of the reorganized church, but still believed the Book of Mormon. And, uh, well, I just broke up with my boyfriend, and here's this cute young man. And so being on this great spiritual quest, uh, <laughs> I went up and said, Gerald, why don't you come over to my grandma's house and tell me more of this? And um, so Gerald was so excited that someone finally wanted to talk to him about anything. <laughs> and, uh, he comes over with uh, all these books. Now, unfortunately for Gerald, it was April 1st. And uh, if he had known me, he would have been on guard, but he didn't know me. So he comes in, and at my grandma's table, I had laid out everything that'd be wrong for dinner. I mean, you know, like pie tins instead of a plate, and different kitchen utensils instead of knife, fork, and spoon. I think I had a measuring cup for a glass, and you know, it, it was all like this, you know. So, and Gerald, he's trying to be the ultimate diplomatic person. Looks at this, takes it all in, you know, this is cool, I can deal with this. And he sits down, and you know, it's obvious that he's not going to say anything, he's going to deal with this, you know. And I just couldn't hold it back anymore, and I just started to laugh uh, about falling on the floor, in fact. And so, it's a wonder our relationship ever went anywhere, because I've been absolutely humiliated the guy the first time. <laughs> Time he comes over. <laughs> uh, well, one of the things Gerald told me about was uh, David Whitmer's pamphlet, Addressed All Believers in Christ. And uh, Gerald started talking to me about how the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants had been changed. And I thought, well, oh, that's something I could figure out. So I went down to the bookstore and I bought a, book, a reprint of the Book of Commandments and I got me a current DNC and I came home and asked my grandma if she would read them with me. Now, See, I didn't appreciate at the time how unusual a grandma this was. To have a grandma sitting there in her temple underwear <laughs> willing to read the Book of Commandments against the Doctrine and Covenants with you doesn't happen in every household. <laughs> um, so anyways, grandma and I sat there for days going through the Book of Commandments. And the time I got through with that, it accomplished two things. I'd never read the Doctrine and Covenants before, and I found it to be uh, a little flat. Uh, and then uh, seeing the changes was very disillusioning to me because I thought God's smart enough to do it right the first time. He wouldn't have to go back and rewrite the whole thing. I mean, doesn't he know three years in advance that he's going to need it worded a different way? We're not talking about translation stuff here, we're talking direct communication to Joseph. <clears throat> but the real problem was when I told Gerald that I was a descendant of Brigham Young, and he says, ah. Have you ever read any of Brigham Young's sermons? And I said, no. And he said, would you read some? And I said, well, I guess so. And I didn't know I was getting set up. So uh, he comes over the next night with several volumes of the Journal of Discourses with the little markers in them. These are Brigham Young's most famous sermons. Y'all at least be familiar with the most famous ones. OK, so here are sermons on polygamy. Will we get statehood? Uh, if we have to give up polygamy for statehood, we'll never get it. That's it. You know, well, that didn't work. Uh, will the Civil War free the slave? No. Well, that didn't work either. Uh, and then there's sermons on Adam God. And I thought, well, they didn't teach that in Sunday school. Uh, that was a new idea to me. But the real clincher was when he got to blood atonement. And I read the one sermon by Brigham Young where he says, let me suppose the case, suppose I found my brother in bed with my wife, I would immediately put a javelin through them both, and this would save them, and I'd be justified, and you know, blah, blah, blah. This is loving your neighbor as yourself kind of stuff. Uh, and that there are certain sins you can commit that the blood of Christ won't cover, that your own blood has to be shed. Okay, so how, here I am, this young girl, raised in a Mormon home, raised to idolize Brigham Young, and I'm looking at this sermon, and my world just fell apart. Because I knew at that moment that Brigham Young didn't talk to God. Or let me put it the other way, I knew God wasn't talking to Brigham Young. <laughs> <laughs> well, this caused all kinds of problems in the family. It was one thing to ask questions, it was another thing to leave. 
Uh, another thing Gerald shared with me was that the Book of Mormon taught one God and it had very different doctrines uh, than the Mormon Church that agreed more with the Bible than it did Mormonism. And so if I was going to really believe the beginnings of Mormonism, I would have to rethink what the Book of Mormon taught in light of what the Mormon Church taught. And of course his pitch was give up Mormonism and go with the Book of Mormon. So Gerald and I had this whirlwind romance, and you imagine how ecstatic my whole family was over this. Uh, in two and a half months, I went from being the most active Mormon girl in my ward about the creation and learning about the church doctrines more. And she just gushed. You would have thought she walked with God. It was the most beautiful, glorious thing. I had missed everything by having a wedding in my front room and not going through the temple. And I thought, well, maybe it was a great ceremony, but the church isn't true. So, you know, it was kind of irrelevant. I, I could never have gone through the ritual because I knew I didn't believe the basics of Mormonism. Uh, later, when I read Temple Mormonism by Payton, I think it's uh, 1930s uh, expose of the temple ritual, I had a hard time putting the two together in remembering how my girlfriend was so ecstatic about her temple experience and reading the actual ceremony, to put those together was a real mind bender because I'm looking at this ceremony and I'm thinking, I don't know if I could have sat through this whole thing. And if I had, I certainly wouldn't have come out and gushed to someone that this is the closest I'd ever felt to God. But that was my girlfriend. She stayed in, I walked away. Well, I asked, uh, started uh, asking questions of my bishop, and uh, he supposedly had answers. And one day he told me, this was in the ward my family was living in at the time we got married. We ran it from my mother, so we were still living in my old ward down in California. And uh, one day the bishop told me that he had found a guy in the ward that had questions just like me, but he had solved them all. So if I would just come to his office Sunday afternoon, we were going to take care of this. <coughs> okay. So I go down to the ward house, and he has brother so-and-so there, who has also struggled with polygamy, Adam, God, blood atonement, and all these things. And so now I'm going to get the big answer. And so he proceeds to tell me his experience and all these problems. And, this, and then this man says, the answer is, you need to read Joseph Fielding Smith, Answers to Gospel Questions, <laughs> and uh, what's the other, Doctrines of Salvation. Well, I'd already looked through those for answers. And I just looked at him and the bishop, and I turned to the bishop, and I said, Bishop, if you think that's the answer, you don't understand the questions. I'm past Joseph Fielding Smith. Well, you couldn't be past Joseph Fielding Smith. <laughs> he, my bishop was a real nice guy. He was a convert to the church, and he didn't know, really know anything about it, so he's relying on this old brother in the ward that's going to solve everything. Well, the bishop continued to try to help me find answers, and he did write me a letter and say that, that uh, if I had a particular question, he would submit it to Joseph Fielding Smith. This is when Joseph Fielding was church historian and apostle, you know, before he later became president. And uh, he says he'd submit it to Joseph Fielding Smith uh, for an answer if I wanted to compose what to me was one of the most important questions I wanted to ask the church historian. And so I... And so Charles and I put our heads together trying to think, okay, what are we going to ask about? What we came up with was one of the things that my family owned were a set of books called The Historical Record by Andrew Jensen. He was a Mormon historian in the 1880s. And in The Historical Record, I think it's volume 7, he has an account of the first vision. But in the 18, I believe it's 88 printing, it refers to the experience in the grove and describes it as an angel. But when the historical record was reprinted a couple of years later, that section was modified, and now when you got to Joseph's trip out into the grove, the being that appeared is labeled the Christ instead of the angel. Well, Brody had brought up in her book the question of the first vision, and we had started looking into the, all that, realized there were some real historical problems on this whole issue. So my question to the bishop, and for Joseph Fielding Smith, was when Andrew Jensen wrote that account of the first vision, and he said the being that appeared to Joseph Smith in the grove was an angel, why did he say that, and why was it then changed to the Christ? Okay, 
get a letter back from Joseph Fielding Smith, uh, which was, um, you know, if this young man, a uh, young woman would just quit listening to the mouthings of enemies of the church kind of response. Uh, when he finally got to the issue, he just passed it off as saying, well, of course the angel was Moroni. And when I'm reading this, I had to come into the bishop's office to read this. He didn't send it to me. I, the bishop got the answer. I had to go to the office to hear the answer. And I'm looking at this paper, and it's and Moroni. I said, Bishop, that's not an answer. Well, it certainly is. I've done everything I could to try to help him. <laughs> you know, and, and, and there's the answer right there. It's Moroni. I said, Bishop, this is an account of the first vision. That Jens is talking about him going out into the woods to pray to know what church is right. And it says an angel showed up. It can't be Moroni. That is not an answer. Either Joseph Fielding Smith did not pay me the courtesy to even look at the documents, or he didn't care what the answer was. But this is not an answer. Well, he agreed with the conclusion of the letter that I was listening to the mouthings of enemies of the church, and obviously the problem was I was infatuated with my husband, who was leading me astray. <laughs> obviously a woman could not have questions, you know. Her husband had to be leading her straight. Uh, in October of 59, I sent a letter to uh, the bishop. We had moved and we were in a different ward now. Uh, no, wait a minute, that's the first letter. Uh, when we finally, uh, I decided to take my name off the roll, uh, we were living in a different ward. In fact, we'd gone through a number of sets of ward teachers because we kept asking questions, you know, and so next month we'd get a new guy. Uh, so when, when I went into Bishop's Court, I, I wanted to explain to them why I had asked for my membership to be terminated, because you couldn't, you couldn't get your name off without having excommunication back then. And I asked them to leave. They said I had to write a letter. So I wrote a letter. I told them I wanted my name off, so they had a Bishop's Court. They served me papers just like a court case. They came right out to the house, two guys, two elders from the ward, handed me the paper that I was called to church court the next Sunday. And uh, so I went and I took several books with me uh, so I could show them what my questions and problems were, why I couldn't believe Mormonism anymore. So I come into the bishop's office and of course it's four against one. They got the bishop, his, uh, well, yeah, his bishop, two counselors, and the ward clerk. And uh, so I said, well, Bishop, I, I just want to explain to you why I'm having these trouble believing Mormonism anymore. And his comment to me was, Sister Tanner, the church is not on trial. You are. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what's in those books. Well, okay. And so they proceeded to build the case of apostasy against me. And, um, and of course, they recounted the, the experiences with the war teachers. Yes, I said that to Brother so-and-so. Yes, Brother so-and-so came to our house. That's true. <laughs> and so he's going through this list, and he says, Now, I have a letter here that your husband sent to your ward teacher. Uh, do you agree with the sentiments in this letter? I said, Well, I don't know. I never read the letter. So he hands me the letter, and he says, Well, read it. So I sit there, and I read through this letter. <laughs> you know, yeah, I agree with the sentiments in the letter. And he turns to the ward clerk. Be sure you enter that in the record. <laughs> so she agreed with what's in there. So... Uh, Amazingly, they came to the conclusion that I was in a state of apostasy <laughs> and um, announced that from this point forward I had relinquished my right to the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> and I said, can I ask a question? <laughs> ah, what is it? And I said, uh, could you tell me, when you say I'm forfeiting my right to the kingdom of heaven, uh, are we talking about all of heaven or are we talking about celestial kingdom, or the terrestrial kingdom, or the celestial kingdom? And Mrs. Tanner, we are not here to debate this. <laughs> I, well, I just think it's a fair question. You know, I mean, you're going to throw me out. I think I've got a right to know what it is I'm giving up. And uh, he huffed a little bit and finally said, well, well the celestial kingdom. <laughs> And obviously that's why I didn't want to tell me, because they didn't want to give me any encouragement that I might have a chance for anything else. <laughs> but, uh, but I was then informed, in most solemn tones, that they would no longer accept my tithing. <laughs> well, 
Uh, the first Christmas out, out, when I get my Christmas cards, I open them up, and here's one from uh, one of my aunts. Uh, has the uh, typical uh, religious scene on the outside of the Christmas card. Inside it says uh, something to the fact, you know, peace on earth, goodwill to men, uh, Christ was born in Bethlehem kind of stuff. Okay, and then she handwrites under this a Book of Mormon verse. And the Book of Mormon verse is, out of the Book of Alma, if thou wilt of thyself be destroyed, seek no more to destroy the church of God. Merry Christmas, your loving <laughs> mother. <laughs> well, we, we were living in Southern California, so we visited around to different uh, churches, but it was very uncomfortable because everything they did was different. We didn't fit in. It's like somebody uh, suddenly told you you had to uh, go to a church in Vietnam. I mean, maybe it's the same religion as you, but you know, you kind of miss what everything is going on. So um, visiting around was a, a very unsettling experience, especially when we got to the one church that between Sunday school and church service served coffee. <laughs> and that was just about more than I can handle. I mean, how could anyone be truly religious and stand in the house of God and drink a cup of coffee. You know, <laughs> Mormonism may not be true, but there are just certain morality issues. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, the summer of 1960, we moved back to Salt Lake to go on with our research, and my grandma was a widow at this point, this grandma young, she was a widow, and uh, she married a Greek convert and I mean a real Greek who had immigrated from Greece uh, and was a convert into Mormonism out of the Greek Orthodox Church. And Grandpa Philegas was his own set of character as well as my grandma. Uh, in a way I think maybe they deserved each other because they both went into the marriage sort of under false pretenses. Uh, grandpa had assumed that he was getting this faithful, wonderful Mormon wife, because see, she always wore temple garments, uh, and went to church, so, you know, she must be a good Mormon. I mean, she's this raving heretic inside, but, you know, outwardly, <laughs> she's got this persona of being a good Mormon. And, and she had a big home close to the Salt Lake Temple. And so Grandpa Falega saw this as a great place to set up his missionary endeavors to win all the Greek Orthodox of Utah into Mormonism. Well, Grandma went into this marriage, assuming that since Grandpa was retired from the Eastern Railroad, that that would mean she would get a free railroad pass, <laughs> and she wouldn't have to jump in everyone's car to go everywhere. <laughs> uh, however, since he went and worked for the Eastern Railroad, his passes were not good in the West, and everyone she knew was in the West, and so it didn't do her a bit of good. <laughs> and now she's got this Greek convert. <laughs> so, uh, Grandpa Philegas was writing all these inflammatory tracts against the Greek Orthodox. I mean, I find it really funny when Mormons say to me, why do you attack our church? No, one, we don't attack other people's churches. And I'm thinking, man, you should have met my step-grandpa. <laughs> uh, he got the Greek community so mad from these little tracts he was writing that he was getting death threats that they were going to come blow up my grandma's house, uh, which did not sell well with grandma. <laughs> now, uh, he was a nice guy. Uh, one of his uh, peculiarities, though, is he had a little bit of problem with asthma. So he would get up at 3 in the morning and have a cup of coffee, but that was medicine, you understand, for his asthma. Well, my mother would, and my grandmother would get up, and at 9 in the morning, she would have a cup of coffee, at which point my grandpa would pontificate on the evils of breaking the word of wisdom. <laughs> and my grandma says, but you got up and had coffee. Well, yes, but that was medicine. That was for my asthma. And grandma said, <clears throat> well, mine's medicine. If I take it at 9 in the morning, I don't have to get up at 3 in the morning. <laughs> Now, we lived just around the corner from uh, my grandma, and uh, the bishop informed my grandmother that she should not associate with us because we were a corrupting influence. 
I thought this was pretty funny since she was the one that started the whole thing by reading Von Brody's book years before. Not only that, she was the one that introduced me to Gerald. <laughs> now my poor grandma uh, had to live that one down for a long time because all the family was sure that grandma was responsible for my leaving the church. And even though my mom had played a role in my questioning in my teen years, she too was upset when I said I was leaving the church. It's one thing not to believe. It's another thing to formally leave the church. And they were all worried about uh, what this would mean in family dynamics and in friendships and uh, all those kinds of things. So even though they didn't believe, uh, neither one of them ever took their name off the Mormon rolls. My mother's still alive, my grandma's dead, but uh, they, don't believe, they didn't believe any of it. Um, one of the things my mother talked to me about at that time was that uh, maybe we should be sure that we've looked at all the options and we should probably try to talk to some of the church leaders and see if, uh, if they did have any answers to the things we were looking at. So we went, made an appointment to go talk to Lamar Barrett, and some of you may remember the old seminary textbook was The Restored Church by Lamar Barrett, and he was a BYU professor. So we went down to see him, and we started telling him of some of the problems and things that we had run across. And, uh, and so one of the things we brought up was uh, the problem with the, the Adam God doctrine. And, uh, you know, here's these sermons of Brigham Young, we got all this stuff. And he looks at this and he says, so i got a list twice this long. <laughs> you know, I'm sitting there thinking, that's not an answer. Uh, okay, well, well, let's move on to the next thing then. One of the problems I have is the changes in the Doctrine and Covenants. And he's all, oh, well, uh, the church is uh, working on that. Why they're, gonna, they're about to bring out a new annotated uh, Doctrine and Covenants that's going to have all the changes marked, footnoted, all the additions when they came in. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, you know, we have nothing to lie, hide. Uh, we're up front. And, you know, well, have you seen such an edition of the Doctrine and Covenants in Deseret Book? I haven't. And that's been a few years ago. Anyways, so that was our experience with him. Uh, one of the other guys we went and talked to was LeGrand Richards. Uh, apostle. Now back then, I mean, the church was only a million people, and you could get into see general authorities easier than now. I mean, not easy, but I mean, you could get into see them. So we went up to see uh, the Grand Richards, and one of the things we had written him about was the problem of the first vision again. And we had told him that there, we couldn't find any reference in the 1830s where anyone ever said that Joseph had told them he had seen the father and son. It looked like that interpretation of the first vision was out of place for the time period. And um, so LeGrand had written back, oh yeah, his grandpa had written in his journal the very day when the Joseph told him of the first vision, he went home and he wrote this in the mid-1830s uh, that it was the father and son. And so I wrote back and said, well, it'd be nice to see the evidence on that. So he invited us up to the office to see that. Well, he gets out a little statement and reads us his grandpa's statement. And Gerald's saying, well, I'd like to see that in context. Uh, you know, he's just got extracts on a piece of paper. I'd like to see that in context. Well, the grand Richard got real huffy. I mean, you did not question the brethren. And uh, here's two young idiot kids that got the temerity to come into his office and question his quote when he typed it out, you know. <laughs> and, uh, well, could we see the context of where that fit? So he begrudgingly walked us over to the genealogical library, uh, which isn't in existence where it was then. It used to be uh, just east of the Relief Society building where the big 28-story office building is at. So he walked us from the little granite building over to the genealogical library and he called for this microfilm uh, for his uh, grandpa and they put it on and wheeled it up to the spot. And so we're looking at this page where the reference is at and Gerald says, well this sounds in the past tense. It doesn't sound like what you'd write down the day. You know, it sounds like Joseph's dead or something, the way this is worded. I'd like to roll it back and see the date and you know, a little more of the context of this thing. Well that really ticked. The Grand Richards off. He had gone to all the trouble to take us to the genealogical library and got up the film, and what more do we want, you know? So these two get into an argument about whether he can roll the film back. <laughs> and uh, I, was, uh, I was so humiliated uh, 
that I was about ready to crawl onto the floor. I mean, everybody in this room was watching us because general authorities did just not walk into the genealogical library. And I mean, it was like God walked in. They're all in awe, you know, hush tones. It's one of the apostles. And so here's Gerald arguing. I mean, a young kid's arguing with an apostle or whether you can roll the film back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the grand whips this film off of the microphone reader and hands it to the lady and tells them, they come back in, they're not to see this, they're just troublemakers. You know, I wash my hands, I try to help them, that's it, forget it, you know. And he stomps out and Gerald's right behind him, why can't I see the film? And I'm meekly <laughs> <laughs> trying to sneak out behind them. <laughs> uh, the funny thing on that is we did uh, later get to see the uh, microfilm, which is a whole other story, but uh, it, it was memoirs of his great grand of his grandfather that he'd written here in Utah years after the event. Supposedly the event had happened in the 30s, but he didn't write it down until many years later. So it wasn't an actual historical proof that Joseph in the 1830s was giving the interpretation of the first vision that it was a father and son. Anyways, that's... Uh, <sighs> I've got, uh, got a whole lifetime of stories to get to yet. Uh, we'll wait. Okay, I've got to find my place here. Okay, when, um, well, when we moved back to Salt Lake, uh, we lived with his folks for a while until Gerald, Gerald could find a job, which was hard because um, when you put down you're born in Provo, Utah, um, and your name's Tanner, the next question is, Oh, are you related to Ann Eldon Tanner? Yes. Oh, and uh, you know what ward do you live in or what? You know, they always got follow-up questions, you know. Well, I'm not a Mormon. <laughs> so, it took him a while to find a job. <laughs> uh, Gerald, when we were living in that ward with his folks during that time, we found out through Gerald's younger sisters, who were active, uh, that his name was still on the rolls. Even though before we had got married, he had asked the bishop to take his name off, he hadn't done it. So we found out his name was on, so Gerald requested uh, termination of his membership again. And uh, at this time, they finally did it. Um, and it was for uh, uh, activity, uh, how do they word that? Unbecoming a member uh, and teaching false doctrine. And so anyways, when Gerald went into his excommunication trial, they wanted him to uh, plead guilty or not guilty to teaching false doctrine. And Gerald said, well, not guilty. And that threw him into this whole confusion. Well, you're the one that asked for your name off. Yes, but I won't plead guilty to preaching false doctrine. But you don't believe like the church does. So obviously you're teaching office of the church. Yes, but it's not false doctrine. <laughs> and so they had a big quibble over whether they could proceed if he wouldn't plead guilty <laughs> to teaching false doctrine. And they finally decided, well, it was close enough. Obviously he was teaching things contrary to the church. So he was excommunicated for apostasy. And I find that funny too when Mormons always say, well, I heard you were excommunicated for apostasy. Yes, we asked for our name off, and it was a real fight for Gerald to get his off, you know. So it wasn't that we uh, did some, uh, they always think, you know, you had to commit adultery or, or get drunk or do drugs or something, you know. But the, there, it's obvious from our letters, if you look in the back of our big Mormonism Shadow Reality book, we have the letters exchanged from our bishops, and it shows that it was at our request. Um, well, I got one of my aunts to start studying the Book of Mormon and to comparing it to the Doctrine and Covenants and to seeing the Book of Mormon taught a whole different theology than Mormonism was putting out. So I'm getting her converted to the Book of Mormon. Now, we still believe the Book of Mormon at this point. We had just given up all of Utah Mormonism, but we were still hanging on to the Book of Mormon. So I'm showing my aunt, see, the Book of Mormon doesn't teach Mormonism. Chuck all that other stuff. Just go with the Bible and Book of Mormon. And... Uh, so, well, this gets my aunt asking all the wrong questions, you know, and answering the wrong questions in uh, Sunday school and stuff. So, uh, finally, the bishop sends his wife down to talk to her and uh, find out what's the matter. Well, you know, have you been reading apostate literature? And uh, my aunt says, no. Well, what have you been doing? I've been reading the Book of Mormon. I've just been studying the scriptures. And the bishop's wife said, well... Every woman I know that has ever undertaken to study the scriptures on her own has always ended up confused 
<laughs> and uh, she was instructed not to associate with me because obviously I was part of the problem. Another one of my aunts uh, that had been inactive for many years uh, was having marital problems and thought uh, it was considering divorce. Uh, and she thought, well, gee, maybe the problem is that we're just not active in the church. Maybe the, the answer is that I need to get reconverted into the church or something. You know? So she asked the missionaries to come around and give her the lessons again. And so when they got to the part of telling her she needed to get back active in the church because then she could go to the temple and you could get an eternal marriage and you would be sealed to your husband for all eternity. And she sat there contemplating in that and she says, gee, that's kind of a sad ending to the story. <laughs> uh, they ended up getting a divorce. <laughs> My maternal, my paternal grandparents, this is my father's parents, uh, were devout Mormons and went to the temple almost every day of the week. One night we went over to visit my grandparents here in Salt Lake and uh, Grandpa McGee wasn't home, so we ended up talking to my grandmother for a while and we started talking to her about some of the problems we had with Mormonism and why we couldn't believe it anymore. Well, the next day I get a call from my grandpa and he's all over me for sneaking behind his back to go and talk to my grandmother when she was alone to confuse her. <laughs> well, since she was on a state mission, I couldn't see that we'd done anything that was terribly unreasonable. One would think a state missionary would be able to discuss these things with you. Well, I later learned from my father of the problems my grandma was having on her state mission. And she commented to some of the family that um, I've learned my part of the discussions but the people I talked to haven't learned theirs. <laughs> well, my dad uh, finally left Mormonism, but when, after he did, he had several strokes, ended up in a wheelchair and in a rest home, and my grandpa went to him and uh, pontificated that the whole problem was that he had given up the priesthood. And that's why he'd had that stroke when he was in the wheelchair. Now, this was despite the fact that his mother, my grandma, had had a stroke and ended up in a convalescent home and died from a stroke. But hers was just part of life to teach you humility and strength and uh, dependence on God. And besides, when she died, God needed her for some reason, you know. And, uh, but my dad's stroke was different. That's because he had a priesthood. <coughs> Well, in 1962, uh, we gave up the Book of Mormon, but continued on with uh, Christianity, uh, which meant now we could find a church home. Before that, we'd visit a church and a pastor would call, find out we still believe the Book of Mormon, and it was sort of like, well, nice to have you visit, you know, and, and they were gone. Um, <coughs> we started mimeographing things, um, gee, from the time we first got married, I think, in 59, but um, our big... Mormonism Shadow Reality Book first started out as a mimeograph book just called Mormonism in 1962, right after we gave up the Book of Mormon. In 1964, Gerald quit his machinist job, and we set up modern microfilm. We were hoping to be able to support our research through the sale of photo reprints of early Mormon documents. That year, we moved into our prestigious home on West Temple <laughs> in what is affectionately referred to as Inner City. The neighbor kids thought we were rich since we lived in the biggest home in the area. Not only that, we were not on welfare. <laughs> this made it easy to keep up with the Joneses, especially since Gerald wasn't in prison as many of the other dads were. <laughs> I remember reading an article in a dialogue some years ago about how many uh, kids you had to have to stop feeling guilty and uh, raised the question whether half a pew was enough. <laughs> well, we fell short of the goal and ended up with three. One year, a college student uh, contacted us for some information to present to his Mormon girlfriend, and she agreed to read some of it if uh, he would be willing to meet with one of the general authorities. So she was able to arrange a meeting with Apostle Spencer Kimball. And so this young man, college student, goes in to talk with Kimball, telling him some of the concerns he had with historical issues, which doesn't look like Mormonism can really meet its claims. And finally, Kimball stopped him and told him, young man, if you really want to buy, find the truth, I will give you the three steps that never fail. First, 
You must want to believe that it's true. Oh. <laughs> number two, you must pray to know that it is true. And number three, you must read only faith-promoting works. <laughs> Well, needless to say, he didn't join the church. <coughs> um, when I left the church, it caused a rift between my sister and me. Uh, a couple of years into uh, our apostasy, one day my sister uh, decided to show me how magnanimous she was uh, and how she had grown in her tolerance level and uh, boldly announced to me that she could now admit in Relief Society that I was her sister. <laughs> One night when we were having a visit from a couple struggling with Mormonism, I gave very stern instructions to our grade school children that they were not to interrupt us on any count. Well, I guess I overdid it. Because when we got through and the people left and I walked into the kitchen, I found our older do oldest daughter, who was probably about 11 at the time, sitting there in the kitchen, patiently waiting, pale as a ghost, holding her broken finger. <laughs> And uh, I felt like such a heel, and I tried to explain, I didn't mean emergencies, you know. <laughs> but such was life growing up in the Tanner home. The kids soon learned that we didn't work on schedules, and if mom was still talking to people in the book room after 5.30, you better just find a bowl of Well, just then there's a knock at the front door, and I go there, and it's a plumber friend of ours that was going to come by to work on the plumbing in our bathroom. Well, I mean, you know, the fireman running in and out the door, you know. and. Uh, so this, uh, this funny old plumber, he's standing there, and he says, is this a bad time? To work out the <laughs> I said, well, only if you're going to shut the water off. <laughs> Many Mormons find it very hard to come visit our bookstore for the first time. Uh, they're always afraid the church some way is going to spy on them and find out about it. Uh, one man that used to come to the bookstore drove this real flashy red sports car. And when he would come, he'd always park down the street and walk to the bookstore for fear that someone would recognize his car because it was very distinctive. And I knew the day he parked in front of the house that he had left the church. <laughs> One couple asked me to sit in the meeting with their bishop. They wanted uh, to tell him about their questions and concerns, but they wanted someone there to back them up. And when they got through recounting all the problems and questions they had uh, and asked the bishop, you know, okay, do you have answers to this? The bishop said, let me explain to you how I became bishop. Growing up in the church, uh, I was active as a kid, but in my teen years I became inactive, and then I went into the service, and I wasn't active. I was drinking and smoking and all that kind of stuff. And then I got married to this little Mormon girl, and I thought, you know, we probably ought to get back into the church. And uh, so the bishop asked me if I would be scout leader. And I thought, well, that's a good place to start. So I was scout leader for a while. And you know, the next thing I knew, they were asking me if I wanted to be bishop. And so here I am. Before I became bishop, I didn't have the, t the inclination to read about Mormonism or study up on it. And now that I'm a bishop, I just don't have time. So I'm sorry. I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> One of the other problems that uh, I face in life is going shopping at Christmas time. I often see people at the malls that I know. The question is, do they want to be recognized? Especially if it's a man walking with his wife. You know, it gets down to it's sort of like being the other woman in a guy's life. Uh, so, <clears throat> in case you're worried, my motto is, wait till they say hi first. Otherwise, I don't know them. <laughs> one of the curious things I find is when people come into the bookstore, they'll ask me, are you one of the Tanners? And when I say, yeah, yes, they ask me, which one? <laughs> I don't really think I look that much like Gerald. <laughs> uh, but I always try to keep a straight face and say, well, I'm Sandra. <laughs> A few years ago, a woman named Sandra Tanner wrote to the Deseret News to complain that I had ruined her good name. <laughs> now she had to explain to people that she wasn't that Sandra Tanner. Boy, she thinks she's got a problem. <laughs> Just imagine what it's like when you are the real Sandra Tanner. <laughs> Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's 11.30. The schedule says that we break for lunch. Uh, those who want to start your lunch may proceed. Those who would like to remain and ask uh, Sandra some questions, she's graciously consented to uh, pretend it's fast Sunday today and forego a little bit of her lunch. We do have some water for you, though. And if you could repeat the question that they asked so that we can get it on the tape. Okay, so you guys got to make a short question, so I, so I got to remember how to repeat them. Guy back here in the black shirt. Um, Sandra, have you ever actually been through the temple, picked up a temple recommend somewhere and taken a trip through? Or? I never went through the endowment ceremony, but I went to the dedication of the Los Angeles temple. Oh, I forgot to mention that in my story here. Uh, if you've been to a dedication of a temple, they do the Hosanna shout thing with the handkerchief, you know. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And I've been told ahead of time to bring my hanky, but you know, they don't tell you what for. <coughs> and so on cue, we all stand up and we're, you know, doing this Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna stuff. And so then that Sunday, back at the ward house, the bishop's walking by uh, between Sunday school sacrament, you know, and I grab a bishop, bishop, I got a question. Uh, yeah? I said, what's all this deal about waving this hanky and saying Hosanna and all this? My word, you'd have thought I'd have shot him. <laughs> he was just horrified and taken aback. And he says, Sandra, we never talk about those things outside of the temple. <laughs> I got to learn, you know. <laughs> and he walks away, and I'm just left there standing there thinking, what was all that about, you know? <laughs> So yeah, you know, I went through the. Uh, I didn't go through the endowment. I went through the dedication of the L.A. Temple. I did baptisms for the dead in the L.A. Temple, but that's as far as I went with it all. But my parents were married in the temple, and you know, my grandparents and not that. So I was fully aware of the underwear and all that kind of stuff. But I didn't know what the ceremony was. Would you like to go to the temple of Higgins a couple extra? Oh yeah. Next year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I listened to the tape recording. I think that will suffice. <laughs> Yeah. You said that you finally gave up on the Book of Mormon. What uh, led up to that? We, in our research, different people we were meeting on our studies on Mormonism had challenged us that there was no historical foundation for the Book of Mormon. You couldn't find any reason to believe that Nephites ever existed and that it flew in the face of absolutely everything in life, universe, and everywhere, you know. So um, we started seriously looking at all of that. I think Gerald had questions about the Book of Mormon earlier than I did. Um, <clears throat> Gerald could perceive the depth of some of the problems uh, before I could see what they were. One of the real influences on me was uh, M.T. Lamb's book, uh, The Golden Bible. <clears throat> Written at the turn of the century, he was a Protestant minister here in Utah that gave a series of lectures uh, on what he saw to be problems with the Book of Mormon. And then it was so popular it was made into a book. Now, the problem with <clears throat> his book is that he makes little witticisms along the way, little sarcastic comments. And when you're still believing the Book of Mormon and you're trying to do this serious study, it's real hard to get past those, because every time you hit one of those, it's kind of like turning the knife in your heart, you know? And, but overall, the logic of the book just came crashing down on me, on top of all the other stuff we'd already looked at that that became the, the final blow when all the pieces just fell into place and I realized this can't be a historical document like it claims to be. Uh, it, was a, it was a very traumatic time to set the Book of Mormon aside, but that, that was the, the real final clincher on the deal. But Gerald had been struggling for some time. He struggled with all of the Bible quotes in the Book of Mormon. King James Bible quotes in the Book of Mormon, you know. B.C., New Testament, King James Bible quotes in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> yes, in the back, in the back. Um, on the subject of, of the authenticity of historical documents, I've kind of always heard or kind of understood that in 1985 when the Salamander Letter became, you know, everybody was getting all agitated about it, the two of you were, were expressing hesitation on it being authentic long before anybody else did. Yes, Gerald, Gerald started to question Hoffman's documents. We'd have questioned sooner if we'd have realized the extent of how many he was claiming to have found. But it was all such a hush-hush deal. You didn't know how many he really was passing around out there. But what we did know about them, uh, the thing, at first we were so excited when we heard about the Salamander letter that Martin Harris was supposed to have written. And uh, Gerald 
very much wanted to, wanted it to be true. We both, you know, this would be a great thing in uh, unraveling the whole story. But when we finally got the text of the Salamander letter, uh, Gerald had just been looking at E.D. Howe's Mormonism Unveiled statements by the early people that knew the Smiths, <clears throat> and he had also read, I believe it was a BYU Studies article that had uh, an account in there by, um, it was a Joseph Knight, I think was uh, the guy, uh, his reminiscences, and there were things in these two documents that Gerald said, the salamander, the, uh, yeah, the salamander letter has to proceed from these two earlier documents. It can't be the other way around. Someone has to have put these two documents together to come up with this letter. And I said, well, Gerald, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe they, it's because uh, these other guys all talk to Harris, and so that all sounds the same because Harris is behind all of the statements. And Gerald said, no. Obviously, someone's read these two statements and they put together this document, and he was absolutely sure, uh, which led to some real problems. Now, some of you uh, it may not have followed our long career enough to realize there was one issue of the newsletter where we had a split editorial. <laughs> and the Mormons accused us at the time that we were hedging our bets. Uh, one argued for and one against, and then that way we're, we haven't come out good either way. You know, man, no, it was real a <laughs> split editorial. Um, and I have finally forgiven Gerald for being right. <laughs> so, another question. May I express gratitude and appreciation to you and Gerald. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. looking for things, or is it uh, the church scholars? You talked earlier about the you know, professor at BYU saying, oh, I've seen all of this. And is that because people like that go on their own digging for it, or is it because others are bringing it to them? Who's the source of digging up? For okay, them? on the question of digging up sources on Mormonism, I think that we right. have a combined effort of many people working on the same problems at the same time, but uh, the Mormon church guys trying to figure out how to put a spin on it and people that were trying to do real history, uh, realizing they had more to explain, like the guys that got involved in the New, history, New Mormon History Projects, realized it was, the, it was getting more complicated to explain why you believed Mormonism, and then there were those of us outside saying, hello, you know, can't you see the evidence? Um, and I think that we act as a course correction to the historians on the inside to make them more honest because they can't uh, as easily put a spin on things because there's, there's too much knowledge today. Uh, the invention of photography was the downfall of Mormon claims because Mormons saved everything and once everything could, could be photographed and passed around, uh, it created its own underground of document sharing um, that we were able to get some help from in our research. But I believe it takes everyone. Uh, I don't think any of us have the only answer of how to view something. And as, as we each put our ideas on the table, it helps to form a bigger picture. And, and I think from that, we see a better outline. I don't think we could leave it only to the new Mormon history crowd because they are still too defensive and too eager to, no, I don't know if eager is the right word, still too tied into the system to put everything on the table. And so, like Will Bagley does his book on Mountain Meadow Massacre, he doesn't owe any uh, favors to anyone. The Mormon Church immediately announces, oh, well, we're going to do a book on the Mountain Meadow Massacre, and our scholars are going to do a better job because they have access to all the documents. And I'm thinking, yeah, well, how come the rest of us don't have access to all those documents? Uh, and it remains to be seen whether they can truly be honest after all these years on Mountain Meadow Massacre. Uh, I'm sure they would be able to write a better history. I don't think they will. Okay, one more. Have you ever run into uh, people in the church, especially uh, within the hierarchy, that have indicated to you that they really don't believe it's all true, but please don't, don't, don't say anything about it? 
not very high up. I mean, I've had state presidents, uh, and one man that was higher up that I can't say where he fit in the scheme of things, uh, that was struggling with the whole thing, but he chose to stay within the system. Uh, but I believe he knows that it isn't really true, but he felt locked in due to his family situation. <coughs> Uh, I've talked to BYU professors, Institute of Religion teachers that didn't really buy the system, but were locked in because of retirement and family. Uh, and it becomes a very hard thing for a lot of these people. I mean, what do you do at 45 if you wake up one day and put the pieces together and say, I don't believe the church anymore? If you're working for the church, <laughs> you got a pretty heavy load to figure out what to do. Also, if you know your wife's going to divorce you and take the kids and you're going to be bankrupt and your dad will disinherit you, um, you know, those are hard issues for people to deal with. Gerald and I, in that sense, were fortunate that we were able to leave together at the start of our marriage. Um, so we had support from one another when our families were telling us off and calling us to repentance and all of those things. Uh, I don't think I would have been strong enough in myself to have done that if I hadn't had Gerald there to, to be an emotional support, to stand against my family. Um, because even though many of them weren't active, you didn't leave the system. And uh, so that became a real burden of all of them, but so. Can I ask one real quick follow-up yeah. question? There was a, a question on the board, on the Republican Mormonism boards about whether or not the general authorities, the higher-ups in the, in the church, really do believe, because they have access to all of this information. What's your personal opinion on that? Okay, the question is, uh, do I think any of the general authorities might not believe? Right. Um, I think that people like Hinckley, Monson, and Oakes know enough church history that I'm not going to surprise them with anything I tell them. Now, how they deal with that, uh, I'm not sure. I am assuming that somehow they have some way split off the spiritual truth of Mormonism with its doctrinal teachings from the necessity of the historical aspects being true. And that by being able to do that in their minds, I mean, that, that there's kind of this process of the church is more true now than it ever was, that we're working out the kinks or something. <laughs> and uh, I just have a problem with that. You know, I mean, to me, it had to start true. I don't see how you get more true <laughs> at the end of the road, you know. So I think they have some kind of, I see a lot of that justification. I have a lot of people that come in and talk to me that are working through that way in their rationalizations. And I'm assuming they're picking it up from higher ups and giving them that kind of rationalization. So, with that, if you want to ask me a question, I'll come afterwards. Thank you.